Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Off the hop for uh, this Chris Johnston Show episode, we want to do stick taps. And in light of what we have read, what we have seen over the last, what, two days, and I know there's more stuff that could be coming, it would be silly for us not to uh, first acknowledge Kyle Beach, the former first round pick for the Chicago Blackhawks, who revealed himself to be John Doe of uh, the ridiculous and disturbing allegations surrounding the Chicago Blackhawks franchise. And he went on TSN. Uh, to talk about what he went through as part of that 2010 team. Uh, I should mention this for this episode, we'll do a little bit of it. We'll do a trigger warning because we will be discussing uh, the allegations of, of sexual abuse and assault. Uh, but we will also discuss uh, the fallout that has come from Kyle Beach's uh, reveal and, and Joe Quenville and so many other news and notes that have come out in the hockey world over the last day. And, and Chris, I have to admit, it's just been, it's been really emotional to kind of Take this all in. You know, I can't think of a more impactful interview that I've ever seen in my years around the league. Honestly, you know, the, the fallout from this story has it. I mean, we're going to, we'd have to go back decades, like way beyond sort of my historical ability to contextualize it, to think of a story that will have a, a bigger impact than this. Like, like we don't know how far this goes, uh, but obviously Stan Bowman's out of his job already. Al McIsaac. You know, I think the NHLPA is under a great degree of scrutiny after, you know, what Kyle Beach revealed in his interview with, with TSN and Rick Westhead. You know, I think there's questions for the league office. Obviously, Joel Quenville and Kevin Cheveldayoff are still going through a process with the NHL. And, you know, my takeaway in watching and hearing, I mean, he was just so articulate um, about everything he'd gone through. Um, so well-spoken about it. So clear. And what happened and what I, my first thought was like, wow, this wasn't just one bad team or one bad moment in time or one GM or team president that, that didn't do what they were supposed to do. I mean, this was a whole system that failed him. And, you know, I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but that just just having it laid bare over 26 minutes, um, uh, you know, it was difficult to watch. It was emotional to watch, but I have nothing but respect and love for Kyle Beach and sharing his truth. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I choked up at different points watching that interview. It was just raw. It was emotional. And he was laying out his truth. Uh, and it was just something that took a lot of guts for him to do. Uh, it took a lot for him to just because I, I always wondered if we would ever know who John Doe is. And I understand there was the high school student who also filed there, who's also part of this as well. And I think there's another Blackhawks player involved in this too. But John Doe is the is kind of seen as the central figure in all this. So the fact that when Rick West had tweeted out that we would see who it is on TSN, first off, when they said it was on Sports Center, I, I can't think of any other time in my life I've ever wanted to see sports center more and then off the top they do the interview it was just yeah i'm, I'm kind of with you i can't think of a more impactful interview that i watched uh with regards to hockey for as long as as i've been alive because it was just it was just so much right and, and look i'm in no position ever to say how anyone in kyle beach's shoes should handle something like this like i that's well beyond my mm. scope of comfort or you know i just I, I don't know what is right but i do know by someone having the courage that he did to put a face to the story uh to speak from the heart the way he did i mean i i think that that i mean it, it we had, you know i i don't know i assume you read the the report that came out on tuesday you know, mm -hmm. you know it's 107 pages it it was graphic and difficult but you know i think when you're attaching a human to a story it it, it takes it to another level and you know I, I, I don't know what's appropriate here. I think that the, it's going to take some time to figure out what the best response to this is. But like, if you told me that Donald Fear or Gary Bettman were to lose their jobs over this, if you told me that the Chicago Blackhawks were stripped of their Stanley Cup championship, like those would be extreme examples of what could happen. I, I'm not sure that 
that isn't appropriate, honestly. And, and, but I, you know, I'm not also coming out and saying it has to be that I, I don't know, but you know, that's where my mind was going to after sort of digesting the interview is like, how do you possibly make this right? You know, this isn't about paying Kyle Beach a large sum of money or whatever. And I know that there is a court aspect to this and there will be a settlement at some point um, to come down the line, but you know, it, it's, it's about fixing a system and, and doing, putting whatever safeguards you can in place to ensure that, that this doesn't happen again. And, and, you know, that feels like that's going to take a lot more reckoning and, you know, I don't even know who the person is to, to make that decision. You know, like I I'm thinking about it now, you know, we're recording this on Thursday morning, Gary Bettman's due to meet Joel Quenville this afternoon in New York city. Like is Gary Bettman the right person to be adjudicating the punishment potentially or not that Joel Quenville and Kevin Seville day off face. I mean, Kyle Beach alleged in this interview that the NHL refused to do an investigation into this very matter earlier this year. And so he wasn't just ignored, you know, by people really close to him in 2010. You know, he was ignored in 2021 when he first raised this issue and filed a lawsuit and and the Blackhawks called it meritless and the league didn't want to pursue it. And the NHLPA, you know, had his cries fall on deaf ears and didn't pursue this. You know, this, this isn't, again, this isn't about one person taking a fall or one, again, it's not one bad actor. I mean, obviously Brad Aldrich is the bad actor and that he caused the original issue, but you know, the, the real sin here is that what happened after, you know, a heinous act against Kyle beach is that no one corrected it. No one stepped in, no one made sure there weren't future victims. And, you know, that to me, that that's that's what's going to leave a lasting impact, and and I really don't have the answer, Julian. I know you didn't even ask for it, but that's kind of where my mind has been. Like, what is the acceptable punishment? What what needs to happen next? Yeah, I, I like I I look at that 2010 Chicago Blackhawks team in such a different light now. I, I understand in back in the day we look at that we can look at that as a, as a team that finally erases this Stanley Cup drought, and they go on to start a, a modern day dynasty. But this is a team that failed Kyle Beach by not taking his his concerns seriously. I mean, they they let him out to dry for three weeks before they did anything. And the anything they did was essentially letting Brad Aldrich celebrate the Stanley Cup with him there. And then Brad Aldrich was was making moves on a 22 year old intern. And do not forget that same team, that same organization had everything that went on with Akeem Aliou going on that same year. Like you mentioned, you know, an extreme, a quote unquote extreme idea of, of taking away a Stanley Cup championship from that team. I'm at this point now where I'm considering everything and maybe, and, and maybe it is extreme. Some people might feel it. If they took it, if they took that ring away from them, I would, I would not disagree with that. I, I think that the Stanley Cup and, and all of this, is is seen as this ultimate prize, and the 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 troubling thing is that Kyle Beach wasn't taken seriously because of that ultimate prize. They put that Stanley Cup above everything, and I know it has that pedestal with regards to sports, but we have to remember that we can't just do that with human beings. So wanna- if they do take away that cup, they should. I, I, you know what? I'll, I'll say it. Like, I, I think they should find a way to take away that 2010 Stanley Cup because of everything that had gone on with the organization that entire year. It, it almost makes me think, too, Julian, that we have to relook at like how we talk about the playoffs in general, right? I mean, so yeah. much of, and look, I've been part of this my whole career and I, I covered that Stanley Cup final back in 2010. Um, but, you know, so much of it is celebrating the lengths people will go to to win it and glorifying the injuries players play through at times in order to try to win it and putting everything, you know, to the side in, in pursuit of this one trophy, you know, that, that is obviously very physically and mentally grueling to, for any team that ever gets a chance to, to play for two months and lift it. Um, but it just seems so unimportant when, you know, cast in this light. And obviously, you know, I had no idea. I didn't know Kyle beach was John Doe until that interview happened. You know, I hadn't even heard whispers, you know, in my circles of who it might be on that team. Like, you know, even though the story's been in the public realm to a certain degree for five or six months, you know, I never personally attempted to find out who Joe John Doe was. And, and um, you know, anyway, it was the first I knew that it was Kyle Beach, but it just, the idea too, that 
So not only does Brad Aldridge get to celebrate with the team, it's not till four days after they win the cup that HR finally approaches him, says, well, we can do an investigation to this, or you can resign. And then he, you know, makes some resignation agreement that includes, you know, getting, you know, a nice vote of confidence from the Blackhawks on the way out, allows them to go on and work elsewhere, allows them to, to have another victim, at least one that's, that's come public. Um, man, it's just a heartbreaking story. You know, I, I think we should mention, because it might not be obvious to the audience, but I mean, this happens in other sports. It happens in other places. This is not only a hockey issue, but you know, this is uh, this particular hockey story is just just a, such a sad story. I just want to add this too. Um, we briefly mentioned uh, the the case on our Monday episode off of questions that were brought up in the Ask CJ segment, and those were just there because those were questions that were asked. I didn't bring those up as some kind of like hidden nugget as to what was going to come for Nick for, for later no, this week. Nobody and, knew and or we didn't. Nobody know, anyway. knew. Yeah. I, I just want to make that clear for everyone uh, watching because we did discuss this briefly on our, on our Monday episode and yeah, with Brad Aldridge, I just I, look that guy. I, it's so, so, and I get it. I, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm coming from an emotional place here uh, and I'm very much far removed from this. The fact that the Blackhawks allowed him to get any kind of recommendation to go work with kids. It it's it's a letdown on, on so many levels. And it's it's just disgusting to to even think that that could happen. And I think of of hockey culture and, and hockey culture is usually this this big buzzword that normally follows a lot of negative. And then you hear stuff like this and you wonder, well, yeah, yeah, there's so much work to be done with the culture here. And, and, and I know I'm a bit all over the place, so I'll try to structure it here. Um, uh, it's funny. I just, I just thought well, of this too. Like Kyle ahead. Beach mentioned in the interview that, that Brad Aldrich was, you know, first of all, he negotiated that he could still get a day at the Stanley cup, which like, is insane. Come on. And then come he on. points out that they allowed him to take the Stanley cup to a high school in his hometown, like after knowing what happened, like it, it's, you know, this, this might come out the wrong way, but sure. let's say we can accept that that what happened between what Brad Aldridge did to Kyle Beach on a certain degree, maybe there weren't warning signs before that. Maybe that was unavoidable. Like I like I don't know that for sure, but let's just say that's let's say, let's accept that as a premise to start this. Okay. Everything still that happened beyond that, there's no reason like it it should not have been allowed to happen. And so even if you accept that maybe this was not preventable as it relates to Kyle Beach, just because maybe nobody, you know, there, this was not the first time, you know, there's no reason to have that concern. You know, the fact that he raised this with them, like that's, that's the part that like, I can't quite shake. And, and clearly that's what Kyle Beach couldn't shake. Like he mentioned the reason he filed his lawsuit. And I think ultimately got to where on Wednesday, he's doing that interview with Rick Westhead is because he found out there was another victim, a 16 year old in, in Houghton, Michigan. Uh, and, and he just, he said that compelled him to action because he couldn't live with the fact that if he just stayed quiet, that there could be further ones down the line. Uh, and you know, that, and that's, that's where I think the league and, and the, the Blackhawks and the individuals that were very close to this, the seven uh, members of the organization in the room on May 23rd, 2010, having the discussion about this. I mean, that's, that's where they all have a degree of culpability. Obviously, you know, there's within that room, there's a different power structure. Maybe everyone's saying it should be the president that makes the call, but you know, everyone there was, was complicit on some level. Absolutely. What do you make of, and I know we'll, we'll I'll have questions about Joe Quenville uh, a little later, but what did you make of all the uh, reaction from players who are in the organization? Uh, Duncan Keith spoke on this. Uh, members of the Blackhawks spoke after their, their game Wednesday night about what had happened. What, what did you think of some of the, Paul Maurice also as well, uh, the head coach of the Jets, whose GM is Kevin Chibble day off. Uh, more of a broad question, but what did you think of the collective responses from members of the hockey community uh, after the report was filed and also after uh, Kyle Beach revealed himself to be John Doe? They were hard to hear, honestly. You know, I didn't I didn't hear enough of the right things there. And, and you know, it, the, the tough part is, is it's someone's word against someone else's, mm -hmm. right? Like Kyle Beach is saying he thinks 100% everyone knew in the locker room. I think Brent Sopel has said that previously to, to Rick Westhead, uh, maybe Nick Boynton as well. Nick Boynton too, yes. Um, you know, but 
I'm willing to accept that it's possible not every single person knew, but I still don't like the way they came across in those interviews, if, if that was the case. And, and look, it, I just think there wasn't maybe enough ownership there. I, I, you almost wish they didn't speak at all. You know, I, I don't know what else really to say about it. I, it just, it didn't help things. And, you know, the fact that Duncan Keith didn't speak to investigators, you know, it, it, I'm sure they gave him the opportunity, um, given that they did 139 interviews and I believe it was something like 21 with, with members of the team. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, they probably didn't miss the Norris Trophy winner in terms of extending the opportunity to, to have that conversation. So, yeah, it's, it's just not enough ownership, not enough leadership. It's a, it's a bad look. I mean, it's just there's, there's, there's no redeeming side of the story other than the courage and, and strength of Kyle Beach. I mean, that's really, there's nothing, no one comes out of this looking good, I don't think. Uh, no. and, I'll, and again, I'll include the media in that. Like, I'm not saying I look good in this or, you know, look at us here. We can, you know, I, I think the whole, the whole system is under the spotlight and there's, it's just, it's just not a pretty picture. Well, let's let's get into that then, because the media, hockey media, is coming under fire for the way that this was reported. You know, uh, Rick Westhead did an incredible job with with the story and the interview on TSN. Katie Strang, my colleague at the Athletic, and Mark Lazarus and Scott Powers as well, uh, they've done some great job, great great work with this. Uh, ben Pope, uh, a local reporter for the Sun Times in Chicago, also uh, part of this, and a radio station uh, out in Chicago. They were the first. To, to even put this story out there. And that's what prompted Rick Westhead to jump in and then the rest of the hockey world. But one thing I see a lot of is uh, a lot of hockey fans uh, looking at outlets like Sportsnet and looking at other big time reporters who they feel that, you know what, they sat on this story. They don't want to compromise their contacts, uh, their relationships with people, and they go about their lives and they don't report on this stuff. And like, like as a reporter myself, like I, I, I don't know how to feel about those criticisms. I, I could understand they're warranted, but I generally feel a little bit like in the middle. It's like, I don't, I mean, as, as, as the person I am right now, like I, I know I'm nowhere near that situation, but I would like to think if I was ever in a situation where I could work on that type of reporting, I would. I'm just curious what you think of, of, of all that criticism that comes in. You're at a much higher stature than I am as a reporter. So you, you might, some of that criticism might actually be going directly towards yourself. Sure. And it's fair. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and, and dodge that. You know, I think one thing I felt personally is, you know, I don't have all the skills necessary to report on this. It's not as a way to skate by and say like, well, that just absolves me. I mean, obviously I should work on that. You know, there was a time I didn't understand the NHL CBA. I worked on that and that's helped me cover stories of that nature. You know, I, I think that there's there's definitely room to do that. You know, I don't know of any reporter, though. I guess there's two ways, like there's two aspects to what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Like I saw some people saying in the wake of Kyle Beach's interview, like media knew about it at the time and didn't pursue it. Like I, I have no belief that that's the case. I, I don't know anyone like I definitely, you know, I was only around that team during the Stanley Cup final. It's not like I covered the 2010 Blackhawks as a beat or anything, but I never heard anything like this at the time. Um, you know, when Gar- when it was Gary Bettman's press conference at the Stanley Cup final, and this was all the, the lawsuit had just come out, I believe the first eight or 10 questions he got that day, you know, one of which or two of which were for me, were on the subject. Um, but sure, certainly, like without Rick said, without Katie Strang, and a few others that you mentioned there, you know, the story wouldn't have had the legs it did or wouldn't have been pursued as, as much. And let's hope that's a learning experience there too. But like, not everyone is equipped to do everything all the time is, is the easiest way I'd say it. But, but you can criticize because it's, it's not without warrant. Um, but it, it's a weird job being a journalist, right? You're the sort of mm-hmm. jack of all trades, master of none. And you know, part of what we do is literally watch people skate at practice and say, hey, this guy's on this line with this guy and, and try to interpret what that means. And then part of what we do is negotiate on contracts, which is business. Uh, we deal with real human emotion. And then something like this, I mean, it's obviously very sensitive. It's very important. Um, and yeah, yeah, I, I think criticize away is, is what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not looking to 
to dodge anything here. It's just, it, it, it was beyond my scope of ability, frankly. And so let's lift up the risk where Quest heads, honestly. I mean, he's, a, he's an investigative reporter. He's comfortable in the court system. Uh, he's, he's got a much greater working knowledge of this stuff and he should be celebrated for it because he's the best in the business at doing that. And, you know, I think he's getting that due now. Um, maybe should have got it sooner. Um, and so, so props to him and to Katie, who's done tons of great work. Katie's a good friend of mine, uh, not just in the hockey space, but she's, she's a master at telling important stories and, you know, let's, let's celebrate those folks too. Absolutely. In fact, they're deserving of stick taps as well. I know I kind of mentioned Kyle Beach at the start, but I think everyone who had a vested uh, interest in, in reporting the story and getting the facts out there are also worthy of stick taps as well. So, so the reporters I already mentioned in terms of Rick Westhead, uh, Katie Strang, Mark Lazarus, Scott Powers, and Ben Pope, uh, among others, uh, who have reported on this story during and also I'll even extend uh, other stick taps to, to Michael Stevens of the Hockey News, who is also who read through the whole report and uh, wrote stuff for the Hockey News as well. And, and Stephen Ellis as well has done some work on it as well. And even some other stuff with Bill Guerin as well, who looks as if he could be taking over for Stan Bowman uh, as the head of USA Hockey, which that in itself is just an absolute joke, considering the fact that he is supposed to be under investigation. I'm that's not sure that's done, though, so. to be okay. fair. Um, you know, I'd heard that myself. Mm -hmm. On uh, Tuesday, and I reached out to USA Hockey. They didn't confirm it. Uh, I, I'm not sure that's done. So I okay. Let, let's not let's not scold them until they okay. make a decision. It's, it's just my view on that. I know there was a report from Stephen Ellis, but you know I'm not sure that's correct. Okay, that's that's very important that we bring that up because there was that report going around, uh, and I know Rick West had even uh, tweeted that out and said, "How is that even possible?" So it's very important that you brought that up, but I just want well, to make yeah, sure. I'm just saying, yeah. look, we'll criticize when a decision's made, but if the decision hasn't been made, let's, let's, I mean, they deserve arrows for other things, but let's not give them where they're not due yet. Totally understandable. Um, the one thing I was just going to say about request Ed, is as someone myself as a journalist who is not necessarily uh, experienced enough in covering those stories, uh, seeing this all unfold, a part of me really wants to be a part of me would love to have the opportunity to shadow a Katie Strang or to shadow a Rick Westhead and learn about how that stuff works. And I think if you are listening to this podcast and uh, you're a young journalism student and you are trying to figure out your place in sports media, you know, pay attention to your media law classes. Uh, talk to talk to professors who are well instructed about that. Well, my media law professor when I was at Concordia was a woman named Janice Tippett, who I believe works at Carleton now. Uh, one of the first things I ever got to do in, in journalism school, we uh, got to be in the spillover room for this massive murder case for uh, this murderer and uh, based in was based in Montreal. His name is Luca Magnata. There ended up being a Netflix documentary about him after the fact. Uh, and I know that's not sports, but stuff like that is how you're able to get a sense of what the court system is like and 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 trials and stuff like that. Like I think if meaningful reporting can come from that sort of stuff. And I hope that people who have an interest in bringing those stories to light and doing those hard stories, uh, I, I would hope that a lot of people after seeing Rick's work, after Katie's, after seeing Katie's work, they're inspired to do that and not just be a journalist who is really only able to do what an AI robot can do in terms of putting together a box score, because that's not, that's not necessary anymore, man. Like if you're trying to go into this game and thinking, all right, you know what? I just want to be the guy that says, okay, this guy scored three times. This guy scored twice in a nice 250 word package. Like that's not how the game works anymore. No, nope, you got to bring more value than that. Absolutely. It's fall. And that means football season is in full swing. And for many of us, there is no better way to enjoy the games than by having some skin in the game. And that's why bet MGM remains the exclusive betting partner of the athletic. And as a fan of the athletic, you can bet $10 to win $150 plus a free three month subscription or extension to your subscription with the athletic. When you bet with bet MGM using our promo code, just sign up at betmgm.com and use the promo code, the athletic pod, at checkout to take advantage of this special offer from the king of sportsbooks. That's bet $10 to an $150 plus three months free from The Athletic at betmgm.com using the promo code The Athletic Pod at checkout. 
new customer offer. Visit betmgm.com for terms and conditions. 21 years of age or older to wager. Arizona, Colorado, Washington, D.C., Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia only. Excludes Michigan disassociated persons. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP in Arizona, 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, Washington, D.C., Nevada, Wyoming, and Virginia, 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help in Michigan, 1-800-GAMBLER in Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. Call or text the Tennessee red line 800-889-9789 in Tennessee or call 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. Um, I want to mention Joe Quenville now. Uh, I put out a tweet and I saw you put out a tweet as well. We both did not feel he should have been coaching for the Florida Panthers Wednesday night. And even if the NHL, who's supposed to be meeting with Joe Quenville uh, later today, I understand, I should have mentioned this off the top, but I realize by the time people get this episode, there may be so many other things that come out. Again, the fact that Quenville and Sheville Dayoff are supposed to be meeting with Gary Bettman, among other stuff, we don't even know. So it's totally possible it could be dated. But in any case, because of the fact that he was under investigation, I thought that would have just been enough for the team or even the league to step in and say, you're not coaching, you're under an admin leave. What did you think of the fact that Joel Quenville was still able to coach on Wednesday night? I have no idea how that was allowed to happen. Honestly, like what could be more important than this? You know, since we've been giving Katie so many flowers, you know, I heard her give a line, something like, you know, right now the games are the distraction from the real story. The hockey's the distraction. It's not the other way around. And given just what was in that 107 page report from Jenner and block on Tuesday, like there was enough direct testimony from Stan Bowman about Joel Quenville, you know, saying things and I'm paraphrasing, but the the spirit of what he was saying was like, we got a chance to win the Stanley cup. We got to focus on that and not on whatever this is. Um, And there was multiple bits of testimony in there. If you read through that alleged that now look, Joel Quenville has a right to tell his side of the story to someone um, you know, he has a right to a process, but that process should supersede anything to do with his job. And so I do know on Wednesday, there were multiple meetings, even into the early afternoon in which it, there was still some question whether he would coach that game for the Florida Panthers against Boston. You know, obviously the decision was made in the early afternoon that he was. And then, you know, Rick Wett said story comes out at six o'clock. I get it. Maybe TSN wasn't easily available there. But we live in a social media world. You know, a lot of my American colleagues, our American colleagues were live tweeting, you know, quotes from that Kyle Beach interview. They were able to see it digitally. Um, You know, even if they made the decision at 645 before seven o'clock or 707 puck drop, whatever, to pull him off the bench. I I mean, it just looks so bad. And the fact he didn't then speak to reporters after the game. So it's like it's important enough and it's okay enough for him to do his job and, and whatever. But, you know, he can't handle the media responsibilities now because with this new information has come to light. I mean, again, I think it's systemic failure. It's it's it just comes from not recognizing how serious this is, how important it is. And, you know, maybe on some level, someone's hoping it was going to go away. I don't know. I, I don't I don't actually know how the decision was made, but I, I do know the indecision, the inability for someone in the room to step up and say, like, this just isn't right. Like. Even if Joel, even if it turns out it's it's not exactly how things played out, you know, what was in that report, which is possible. That testimony, as far as I understand, it wasn't given under oath. You know, I, I'm just saying that there could be more to the story that isn't included there. Someone sure. has to get to the bottom of that story before he works again. And, and it should be of utmost importance to him, no matter what he thinks his level of involvement was or wasn't, that that gets done behind the scenes with him out of public sight, with him not part of the Panthers. I mean, again, what could be more important right now? Yeah. Florida's at a great start to the year. They're seven Oh and Oh who gives a shit. Seriously. Who cares? Like, how is that more important than, I, I mean, it's, it's just, it's mind boggling to me that that happened. I, and clearly they recognize they made a mistake because otherwise he's speaking to the media post game. You don't have his GM coming out and, reading a prepared statement. I mean, they failed this guy 11 years ago. They're still failing him today. That's just a fact. And, you know, again, I don't know how far this goes, Julian. I don't know. I I just feel like it's not stopping at Joel Quenville either. And 
you know, no. I, I don't know how, what form this is going to take, but this, this, this hit really deep and it's still exposing issues in the system that are there now in terms of dealing. Like there's, it's so established. If a player does something on the ice before they've made a decision, they'll suspend him indefinitely or give him paid leave or call whatever. Like there's just a lot of mechanisms to do this and still be fair to Joel Quenville, but putting him on the bench is fair. Like it's, it's just, it's just the wrong look. And I think they recognize it when it was too late. And, and I don't know if we'll see him behind the bench again for that team. Honestly, I don't know that. I don't think we can say that with any certainty now. I mean, after his meeting with Gary Batman, I, I mean, it's hard to know what the punishment will be, but I, it's possible that was the last game he ever coached is, you know, 15 minutes or half an hour after that, that interview aired. Yeah. Um, I, I think that if, more of what's out there is corroborated. Joel Quenville should not be behind any bench, whether it's pro, amateur, whatever. He should not be behind the bench. He definitely should not have been behind the bench on Wednesday night. And the fact that he was allowed to is an absolute joke on the part of the Florida Panthers and on a part of the National Hockey League. The National Hockey League should have stepped in themselves and said that both Joel Quenville and Kevin Dayoff until we meet with them, are placed on some sort of administrative leave. The fact that they were both, I mean, I understand as a GM, you're not in the public eye. Maybe Kevin Dayoff wasn't necessarily doing any duties, but Joel Quenville was definitely doing his duties behind the bench on Wednesday night. And I well, think whether... I, I yeah. just thought of something. So it's my understanding right. that, that the, the league and the Blackhawks got this report on Monday. Right. And so they started to digest this Monday. You know, the public didn't see it until Tuesday afternoon. You know, they should have by Monday realized, like, we got to speak to Joel Quenville. Like, to me, they should have said, you're coming. Like, even if it even if it happens that Tuesday comes out and then they say, Joel, you're not coaching tomorrow and you're coming to New York for the meeting Wednesday. Like, what, what is, you know, and why, as as of this recording, as we understand it, Kevin Dayoff is speaking with Gary Batman on Monday. Like, I, I think waiting three or four days, there's just no reason. Again, what is more important? I know the league, there's a lot going on. Coordinating schedules is difficult. Look, you can even do some of this over Zoom initially if you have to. Seriously. You know, we, we've all learned to live in a Zoom world. Like, you know, Kevin Cheveldeff was on the West Coast with the Jets. Gary Bettman's in New York. Joel Quenville's in South Florida. I, I get they're spread around the continent. But but I, I think that there has to be, there needed to be a little bit more swift intent to figure out what's going on here. And I think that that inaction in a strange way, it's just going to create even more pressure for for some for for something to happen here, I mean, it, it it's just it's just a failure, man. It's a total failure. Yeah, I, it, it's I, it just kind of feels like the NHL in a way is kind of dragging its feet over this too. And already there was skepticism on how the report was even going to be handled with the way it was being done independently and all that, and, and what they would do with it. Uh, and actually, that brings up a whole other question that I didn't even ask yet: the the punishment for it. They get fined like two million dollars, which is less than what they punished the devils for a contract that circumvented the salary cap uh, in Ilya Kovalchuk. I don't even feel that punishment in ish, that initial punishment from the NHL was sufficient. Like I, I think with teams, you have to, I get it. Money is where you hit them, but I think if they hit draft picks as well. And again, I'm, I'm still thinking that Stanley Cup championship of 2010 is like, you got to look at that. Draft picks are more important than money in, in the Hell context yeah. of this business. I mean, these are, we're talking about multi billion dollar enterprises. Like the Chicago Blackhawks played a game on Wednesday night. You know, they have the, the largest arena in the league or, or second largest with Montreal, one or the other, you know, and I nearly sold it out. So they might have made $2 million in gate in that one game. Like they, they might have covered that, that fine in one game on the day that all this is blowing up. So the $2 million is immaterial to someone with the kind of wealth the Wurtz family has and that organization has. You know, what they can't get is if you hit them with draft picks. I mean, you could you could take away five first round draft picks. Yeah. You know, what do they do then? Then they are in big trouble for the next five to 10 years. You know, then they're going to suffer financial consequences because it's going to weaken their fan base. You know, unfortunately, maybe one of the reasons the NHL wouldn't want to do something like that is because it also weakens the NHL. I mean, we're talking about one of the premier markets in the league. Mm-hmm. 
you know, so there might be the fact that there's some, some conflicts of interest there in terms of mediating the right punishment. Um, but it, 2 million bucks wasn't enough. And the loss of two jobs, you know, the two remaining members of the Blackhawks isn't enough either. And I, and that's why I suspect we're going to be talking about this for another, who knows how long, because I think the, the ramifications will continue to be felt and there's, there's going to need to be way more of a cleansing here. I mean, he, even the National NHL Players Association, like they, they they kind of escaped much criticism on Tuesday with the report. I know there was some stuff buried in there about them, but, you know, there's a total failure there. I mean, the union there is there to protect Kyle Beach. And, you know, I saw Donald Fear put out a statement early Wednesday morning or Thursday morning, sorry, the days are blending here. Mm-hmm. You know, it seems like he's sort of suggesting that the program doctors that, that Kyle Beach spoke to are meant to, you know, keep a degree of privacy between players and and what have you. But I mean, something like this needs to be elevated literally to the top level the minute they hear about it to ensure that there's swift action. And so something's got to happen there too. Yeah. Um, In in terms of now I'm thinking of Stan Bowman and what really bugged me was how the Wirtz family, how Jonathan Taze also uh, I don't remember who else, but I, I just did not like how Stan Bowman was characterized. Jeremy Colton. Jeremy Colton as well. I did not like how he was characterized after his resignation. Like he did wrong. You know, you, everyone saying, you know, that's not the stand that I know. I'm sorry. But like, you don't, it's very clear. You don't know him that well. He hid and did his part in trying to cover up something that ruined a hockey player and a person's life. You don't know that person as well as you think you do. And saying that he deserves better, or I'm paraphrasing when I say that, but just characterizing him as this decent human being after the fact is just an absolute joke. That might have bugged me like even more than so many other parts of the details of this story. Like there's no sense. Just as we kind of alluded to before, like if if you don't feel to say anything, just don't say anything. You're better off just doing that because some of the reaction that has been kind of more or less kind of making Stan Bowman into some sort of sympathetic figure, sy- sympathetic figure, excuse me, I don't know why I can't speak, is absolutely disgusting. It, it, it's it's such disrespect to what Kyle Beach endured, you know? Like, it, it that has bugged me so much. Isn't it telling the best quote of the whole thing came from Alex DeBrinkett, who's like a fourth-year player in the league? He was like 12 when this happened. Right, but like... You know, the last guy on earth really who has to answer to this, he was certainly nowhere near the organization when any of this went on. And he's like, yeah, Stan should have been fired. (laughs) This needed to happen. I mean, maybe that tells you something. There might be a generational shift going on a little bit. Um, And and that might be partly what this is, is that those that have been around and part of the establishment don't see its flaws and, and don't understand maybe truly how serious this is and 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 what it suggests. And, you know, a problem hockey will have, and this doesn't just pertain to issues of something like sexual abuse, but, you know, so much of it is celebrated about, you know, keeping things in house, being a team, the, the we before me. And, you know, a lot of those traits are beautiful, honestly. I mean, I, I, I don't, I do think that there's there's so many amazing people in the sport because they they really can be selfless and they they try to do what's right. But you know when you're when when that same institution is protecting something that shouldn't be protected, you know that's that's where you get a problem here. When when the institution is valued above the indi- the individuals within it, that's where you get these kind of issues. That's that's the kind of structures where these sorts of things happen. And it's pretty clear they had that in Chicago. You know, I suspect it's not just there, by the way. I mean, I, I don't know of anything at all. But Maybe. when you see when you see the rot here, it's it's not very hard to start imagining that this isn't an isolated incident in an, in an isolated city with an isolated franchise in an isolated league. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot more out there. And, and, you know, that's why I think it's important to have these conversations. And it's important that there's real action. There's real consequences for the people involved. Um, because that does increase at least the chances that, that it's reduced or hopefully eliminated at some point in the future. Yeah. We, the whole, we before me thing, you know, to a point it should, it should work for our on ice stuff, but clearly through this cow beach story, we see the, we before me thing could, has also ruined it, it. It ruined his life. 
the way that the, the way his team kind of handled it. Um, I also want to give stick taps to uh, Paul Vincent and and Brent Sobel and Nick Boynton as well, who at different points of of, of this whole timeline of the story uh, spoke on the record about what happened and tried to ultimately help uh, Kyle Beach and and corroborate what had happened. And I don't think we should forget about those people as well, because this could have easily been a story where, you know, Kyle Beach as John Doe, it's out there and then it's just kind of swept under the rug and we don't really give it that much attention. But I think just as important as as, as Katie Strang and, and Rick Westhead and everyone else's reporting has been, they need those sources to say something and, and, and kind of help, you know, Kyle Beach in this case. So I think those players are also worthy of some praise as well. Pretty telling that Kyle Beach described them as his heroes in the interview. I mean, you know, we're looking at at Kyle Beach as a hero, and he absolutely is, I think, beyond question. But, you know, he needed to be lifted up, too, in those moments. And and you can imagine how lonely he must have felt, you know, starting to put this out there, even under a pseudonym, um, you know, challenging an establishment, knowing that probably even though he gets identified as John Doe in the documents, that eventually the day is coming where the world's going to know. I mean, he did acknowledge it. Part of the reason he came forward as well as the Jenner and Block report more or less pointed within a reasonable doubt to him. If you really wanted to look at the specific details provided and you want to comb through the details of a roster, you could sort of figure it out anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, but it's a step towards his own healing and he needed those people to help him. He needed a Rick Westhead to champion him and Katie Strang and others to, to get to the point where he has that today. And, you know, there was a hopeful tone to his interview. I mean, it was, it was heavy and emotional and, and you can see, you could feel the weight of it, but you know, I, this, you know, this, this is a freeing for him too. This is no longer just his private burden. And, you know, he doesn't get there without the people you mentioned. And I think that's why they're, they're more than deserving of our stick taps too, Julian. Absolutely. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else on this that uh, I missed out on that we need to mention as well. There's a lot of information I understand we we didn't comb through the report like what happened on the Steve Dangle podcast. We focused a lot more on on some of the reaction from the fallout of the report and from uh, the Kyle Beach interview as well, which I think that's important to do. And I wanted us to be a lot diff- a little different than what uh, Steve had done and and the rest of his team with their latest podcast episode. That podcast is going to have Rick Westhead on their show on Friday. Uh, so you're going to want to check that out when that episode comes out. But uh, CJ, must is there listen, anything else? Must I, listen. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else on this uh, that you want to talk, want to discuss that I didn't ask you when it comes to this topic? No, I think we put a bow on it. I mean, look, you can file, follow Kyle Beach on Twitter, send him some love there. I, you know, I've seen so many people in just my timeline be doing that, you know, and let's support this man. Like he wants to, you know, he said himself, he wants to be part of the change. He wants to, you know, he's still playing third division hockey in Germany, but, you know, he's 31, I believe, you know, at a certain mm-hmm. point, he's going to be transitioning into a life beyond this. And, you know, I suspect this will be his life's work on some level, you know, trying to ensure things like this don't happen again. And so let, let's follow him, let's support him, let's listen to him. And um, yeah, just believe the survivors. You know, I think that that's pretty important when you, when you see, again, when you see someone speak the way he did, it's just, you'd have to have a cold, dark heart not to feel something and to think like, wow, this, this just, this is just a catastrophe. So let's, let's do what we can to make sure these things aren't repeated. Well said. And uh, CJ, I know you also wrote about uh, Kyle Beach in your latest uh, opinion piece that's up on the Toronto star as well. So I'd ask everyone to check that out uh, on top of obviously subscribing to our podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts, wherever it's on YouTube or any other streaming platform. Um, We'll be back on Monday with a brand new episode. Uh, we'll send out a prompt for questions as Mondays are the ask CJ days. Uh, and just take a listen to every other podcast that's on SDPN. Uh, one thing that's really cool about this network so far off of what we've seen is that, uh, we're surrounded by people who are not going to shy away from stories like this on the respective platform. So it's, uh, this makes this a pretty, this makes this a pretty cool platform to, to be on. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for listening to this episode. We know it was really heavy. You know, it was a lot to take in and it's very likely there's going to be even more information that's going to come out. I have a really weird feeling about uh, this story and and what other reverberations could come from it. But 
I'm glad that you were able to stick it out this far and listen to everything that CJ and I have to say, because it's important that we keep these stories out there in the public eye for people to, to know what's going on. And I'm, I'm hoping for that generational shift where players are not afraid to speak out about what's going on and are not afraid to make their stories heard and to let everyone know that they're survivors and that they need help and that the people who are not giving them that help and the people that are not letting them uh, be, her- be heard can ultimately see their downfall and, and, and ultimately not be in those positions of power anymore because we cannot have this for the benefit of our game, of the game of hockey. Uh, we cannot have this. And hockey culture ultimately needs its change. Uh, for CJ, I'm Julian saying so long. And uh, we'll be back on Monday with a brand new episode of The Chris Johnson Show. Thank you. Respect to Kyle. The Chris Johnson Show. Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter, at ReporterChris. And follow Julian McKenzie, at JKMcKenzie.